Uh, and on behalf of the Samson Institute for Aging Research and the Daily Maverick, I'd like to welcome you uh, to the first in the series of lecture, uh, in, in the first in the series of lectures and conversations uh, with key opinion leaders on improving the well-being of older persons. This series of lectures have been made possible by the family of the late Abe Rabinowitz. The Rabinowitz family have given this in the honor of Abe Rabinowitz, who grew up in Nepal and graduated top of his class at UCT as a chemical engineer. He was a lover of the outdoors, classical music, and wine. Abe passed, passed away three years, years ago at the age of 92, having suffered a long and devastating complex neurological illness. Uh, his family have sponsored this lecture series in his memory in order to acknowledge the outstanding medical care he received over the course of his illness and the critical importance of advancing holistic elder care in and beyond the local community and to support those who are taking care of any elderly patient. His wife Evie is with us in the audience tonight. However, his four children are unfortunately overseas at present, unable to attend the first lecture. SIFAR is a non-profit organization which has been established through a generous uh, grant from the Eric and Sheila Sampson Family Foundation. Uh, we're also most grateful to the Daily Maverick who have partnered with, in this series of lectures with us. Uh, SIFAR is based at Highlands House in Cape Town. Our work focuses on generating evidence on and awareness of the health, well-being and social needs of older persons and developing tools to support the provision of age-friendly health services, particularly at the primary care level. We also work towards improving the care and the training of caregivers who are working in the sector. Uh, the world is growing older. The concept of healthy aging is that of developing and maintaining our functional ability that enables well-being into old age. The environment in which we live is one of the key features of maintaining our functional ability. Our environment includes our relationships that we have with others, the built environment, attitudes and values that are non-ageist, uh, health and social policies and state institutions that can create an enabling environment for older persons. South Africa is faced with an enormous burden of disease relating to child and maternal health issues, infectious diseases such as HIV and TB, chronic diseases of lifestyle, such as diabetes and hypertension, and the added burden of preventable deaths and injuries from trauma and violence. Uh, this leaves little scope for aging on the health agenda. However, with South Africa facing a demographic shift towards an older population, an estimated 15.4 million people going to be over the age of 60 by 2030, is it not now time for us to start addressing the needs of older persons? as a matter of priority. Growing old is not a disease, and it should be one of our most fundamental rights. And I thus come onto the third pillar, which will hopefully support SIFAR's vision, and that is to add the advocacy role that we believe that we as an institute have and in playing in society. It's to engage with broader society so that the voice of the older persons can be heard, which will hopefully have an impact on policy makers so that positive changes can be effected. Tonight is a great honor to welcome Edwin Cameron, who, as you know, has been at the forefront of human rights activism for well over four decades in South Africa. He's one of the most progressive judges in the country, and one of our leading intellectuals. He has led the fight for reform of HIV policy in the country, brought gender equality into the mainstream, and been one of the most vocal supporters for LGBTQI rights worldwide. Despite his incredibly busy schedule, he has offered to launch the Abe Rabinowitz Memorial Lecture Series with a talk on the rights of older persons. At the conclusion of Edwin's talk, Marianne Tom of the Daily Maverick will engage in a discussion with Edwin on issues that are relevant and open it up to the floor for discussion and audience participation. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Majority white audience, very quiet. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, we're all learning. How are you? It's a real pleasure to be here. Nathan, I call Leon by his younger brother. They're both equally earnest and equally funny. Leon had his earnest look on this evening, but it's a great pleasure to be here with you, Leon. And Marianne, thank you very much for agreeing to anchor this evening. I'm looking forward to our discussion. 
And very, very nice to be here, ladies and gentlemen, in this very beautiful venue. It's one of Cape Town's most beautiful venues, isn't it? And I think the topic that we're talking about was one that I surprised myself with how much there was to learn about it. Uh, from the constitutional, statutory, international point of view, it's been quite a discovery for me since Leon asked me to speak about this. And I think we're going to have a fascinating, uh, a fascinating interchange. There's some specialists here whom I've already met. Uh, and I think that we're going to have interesting contributions from the floor and an interesting d uh, debate between Marianne and myself. But I want to start by speaking about the nature of prejudice, prejudice stereotypes, attitudinal blocks towards other people. And research has shown that the three greatest bases for humans to ascribe stereotypes to each other are or race, gender, and age. Now, race and gender have formed uh, a, a significant part of the public debate about values over the last five or six centuries, but aging has not. And it has become unacceptable to uh, ascribe people's stereotypical uh, um, qualities on the basis of whether they're a man or a woman or whether they're black or white or anything else. Uh, not that it doesn't still happen a lot, but it's become conventionally at least unacceptable, and yet ageism remains, the third ism, it remains uh, the, the great basis uh, for ascribing uh, 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 attributes to people and for basing discrimination on it. It's the most socially condoned and institutionalized form of persistent discrimination. What do we ascribe to, to older people? Ill health, frailty, vulnerability, confusion, sickness, incompetence, mental decline. Those are all the things that we readily assume someone who is older than us. The other aspect of ageism is that it's not recognized either nationally uh, or internationally. There is some movement internationally to creating a United Nations Convention on aging, on, 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 on older people. And there have been preparatory steps in the international bodies towards doing this. They're trying to get a special rapporteur appointed by the UN, uh, the UN international system to report on this. But it hasn't happened yet. And yet the paradox, ladies and gentlemen, is that aging is one of humanity's great triumphs. If you think how incomparably better our lives are than a few centuries ago, even just a few decades ago, think that penicillin was only made available in the course of the Second World War, uh, dentistry, antibiotics, and our lives have become lengthened, and not just have our lives become lengthened, but the, the, the quality at all ages has been vastly improved, mainly through nutrition and medical science. So there's been a great shift in almost every society, I won't give you the demography that I picked up uh, in preparing for this lecture, in the United States particularly, the baby boomers, who the generation born roughly between the end of the Second World War in 1945 and 1965, the second Lyndon Johnson pre uh, presidency, they are all aging now. Uh, I was born in 1953, I'm 64 this year. And the baby boomers in the United States, that, that, that great increase in fertility, in, in reproduction that, uh, that, that, that beset the United States in that period, round about 1950 before and afterwards, is now at the, at the point where they're aging. And another phenomenon is that in many cultures, there's been a shift from the extended family to the nuclear family. And this has had very significant uh, socio-demographic effects on aging people. The one distinctive feature about ageism, of course, is that unlike race, gender, being gay, being transgender, being black, being white, with age, it's something that, if you're lucky, you will eventually fall part of that demography. So it's, it's, it's an interesting feature of the topic of aging, which raises many tantalizing questions. 
Why are there so many prejudices if all of us, whatever our age now, I'm tempted to do an audience survey and ask who's the youngest person here. I think I can see it's probably one of Leon's researchers. Lindega, you look very young. And that's, that's also probably a stereotype, by the way. Are you still in your 20s, Lindega? I think so. So we've got people from the 20s right into Benny, I don't, I'm not going to say how old you are. Advanced years and good health, which is wonderful. So we, we face transforming from being outside the stereotyped and discriminated against group to being part of it. Today's young, if they are very fortunate, will be tomorrow's old. And despite that, negative attitudes and prejudices persist. And of course, not solely negative attitudes uh, uh, and, and, and prejudices. Of course, one of the tantalizing things about ageism is that it's often combined with feelings of beneficence, feelings even of patronizing elder people. And often, the prejudices that the research shows are passive rather than active. They condoned rather than actively encouraged. One must also distinguish between age-appropriate differentiation and ageism. Ageism is a negative connotation ascribed to any person on the basis of his or her age and a consequential attitude of discrimination or exclusion or ostracism or demeaning uh, opinions about that person. Age-appropriate differentiation means is it right for you to have assisted care now? Is it appropriate for you to continue working? Do you need special medical care? Should you have another eye test? Age-appropriate differentiation is often helpful. And of course, in that distinction lies the essence of human rights, because we approach human rights on the basis that people aren't the same. We afford people the same rights, but knowing that no two human beings are the same. So the complexity of human rights practice and of the court in which I work is that you have to find a human rights solution that is individually appropriate, but which is also uh, capable of, of being generalized, generali generalizable ac across, across all categories. Another fascinating thing about ageism, ladies and gentlemen, is its source. And I'm going to return to this in my concluding remarks in a, in a few minutes' time. Its source lies profoundly within ourselves, each of ourselves, and it is our own fear of death, of debility, of human frailty, of mortality, of sickness. And that is why we often flinch from dealing with our own inappropriate ageistic con conceptions because of the fear that is located within ourselves. I think we've seen that uh, in our country's engagement with the AIDS epidemic, much of the fear about HIV, I'm someone who's lived with HIV for a very long time. I've experienced a lot of reactions to myself as someone living with HIV. I've experienced a lot of reactions when people didn't know that I was living with HIV because for many years I kept it a secret from most people except those very close to me, including my family. And my sister's here. She's a very young 60-something. Uh, but... Of course, the response to AIDS, the response to cancer, the response to any human frailty is often premised on our own fear of that happening to ourselves. It's premised on our own revulsion at that, the idea that our own mortal term will one day arrive and the inability to accept that. And of course, Sigmund Freud had something to say about that as well a fear of loss of faculties, capacities, mobility, status, economic power, and then we compensate for that by resiling from the issue, resiling from the people, and becoming ageist. 23 years ago, although sometimes it doesn't feel uh, as though it really happened, given the events happening in our country now, we got a constitution, and our constitution got, at its heart, a non-discrimination clause. And at the heart of the non-discrimination clause 
are 18 conditions on the basis of which it is prohibited unfairly to discriminate against anyone else. Just talking about my throwaway comment about our present circumstances, Leon, when we walked in tonight, said they probably want you to talk about the Sasser case and what's happening in the country's politics rather than about ages. And so we shut down the present discussion and talk about that, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> Marianne's being a very good moderator. She's being disciplined and saying no, quite <laughs> rightly. And ladies and gentlemen, one of those circumstances is age. So we have a constitutional protection against unfair discrimination, but the paradox, of course, is that we also have constitutional protection against unfair discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, ethnicity, culture, language, uh, skin color, uh, descent, so in, in, in our very, very wide and encompassing, very warm-heartedly progressive equality clause, we've got the widest set of protections anywhere in the world, and age is one of them, but like with all those other conditions, the gap, the dichotomy between the constitutional aspiration and the lived reality is quite painful. The legislature also, Parliament, has not been inactive. In 2006, it enacted a very, very fine statute. And I, I mention the statute because uh, it makes the point that I've already made about the disjunct between our aspirations for what things should be and the way things are in practice. It's a very fine statute, it, it's well-crafted, it's articulate, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, finely conceived and well-directed. It says that an older person is, in the case of a woman, anyone over 60, in the case of a man, anyone over 65, which is something paradoxical because, of course, women age somewhat more slowly than men, even though both men and women think the opposite. <clears throat> It focuses on a move from residential to community-based care. It has a rights emphasis. And of course, like many of our statutes, it also has teeth. In section 30, subsection 1, it says that anyone who abuses an old person commits a criminal offense. And in the penal provision, it provides that if you abuse an older person, which is the particular provision here, there's a sentence of up to five years old, uh, up to five years imprisonment, plus a fine or a fine without the, with, uh, uh, imprisonment without the option of a fine. I want to read you the definition of abuse. Abuse can be, it can be physical, sexual, psychological, or economic. And it's, it's very, very widely expressed, and I'm going to say something about that in a moment. It's defined as any conduct or lack of appropriate action, so it's both omission and commission, occurring within any relationship in which there is an expectation of trust, which causes harm or distress, or is likely to cause harm or distress to an older person, as defined, 60 plus or 65 plus. That constitutes an abuse of an older person. Now, there are lawyers present here tonight, apart from Benny. I think a lawyer would immediately complain that this is a startlingly wide definition, not just startlingly wide, because you can be wide but precise, it's startlingly wide and completely imprecise. And the lack of precision is not just in what is a relationship of trust, but it's what is a relationship in which there is an expectation of trust and in who lies the expectation. Harm or distress, harm, a lawyer would be able to define their legal precedence on harm. There are legal precedents on distress as well, but it's a much broader concept than harm. So from my point of view as a constitutional judge, uh, I would say that this definition might be vulnerable. I keep an open mind, I keep an open mind on a lot of things nowadays, Leon including everything that's happening at the moment, which is why Marianne is right, we shouldn't talk about it. I've never had such an open mind in my whole life, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. I've got opinions on nothing. 
because everything might come before us, and who knows what it will be. So from that point of view, there may well be a, an interesting challenge to the ambit of, 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 of that definition. And then I return to the point that I foreshadowed, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a very fine statute. The interesting thing about the statute, I was talking to my law clerk, my law clerk, Daniela Lupini, who helped me prepare this talk, and she thought that there was an express prohibition in the statute against discrimination on the grounds of, a, of age. Interestingly, the legislature in the year 2000 enacted the Prohibition on Unfair Discrimination uh, uh, Statute, which is called the Equality Act, Promotion of Equality and Prohibition of on Unfair Discrimination Act of 2000. And that contains a prohibition on unfair discrimination on the grounds especially of, ra of race, sexual orientation, uh, and, and culture and language. The statute doesn't enact that. It, it, it's, it's an interesting anomaly uh, of, the, of, 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 the, of the statute. And one would have thought that it did have, have a, uh, it, that it would have had a, a prohibition. We've had one case on age discrimination before our court. It's a case concerning a Captain Sali. He was a Tlosa speaking man from the Eastern Cape who was required by the police to retire at a specific time. He brought his case and for many reasons, including that he hadn't raised the, the point about age, in either the Labour Court or the Labour Appeal Court, we declined to hear it. One of our colleagues, my colleague Justice Chris Jafter, thought that we should entertain the age point. The other ten of us, very dully and, and uh, in, with great loyally sobriety, thought this was not the right case. But there's a case waiting there. And interestingly, one of the areas where there's the greatest discrimination against people on the grounds of age, not just for reasons of age differentiation, because you can no longer lift the load of bricks, or you can no longer walk the distance, or do the driving, or complete the calculations, or see the number of patients in, in your practice. That would be age-appropriate differentiation. Most of our statutes have ageist prohibitions. The Labor Relations Act is particularly interesting here. It says that it will not constitute an unfair labor practice for there to be a retirement age in an enterprise. It's very interesting. It's never been challenged, uh, and that's another challenge which would be very interesting from a constitutional lawyer's and a, and a constitutional judge's point of view. Because in the European Economic Community and in the United Kingdom, there's no longer any formalized uh, retirement age. And in my view, that's where we should be moving towards. Of course, judges do have retirement ages. Uh, for most judges, the retirement age is 70. Uh, and in our court, there's a term limit of 12 years. So I will reach the term limit just before my 68th birthday when I'm 67. I'll have to step down then, but I'm entitled to retire next year when I turn 65. But I would certainly think that with a growing population of people upon whom we are not imposing ageist uh, stereotypes and, 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 and preconceptions and prejudices, that we should be moving towards the position in the United Kingdom where you negotiate it with your employer, you work for as long as you're able to do the job in a proficient way. If you stop doing the job in that proficient way, there are ways to deal with it. There are performance appraisals and in performance inquiries, and you say to the person, well, it's, it's time to move on, and many people will be ready to move on at the time when it's appropriate. It's not as though it's going to be impossible to do that. Marianne, I've got three more points. How long have I spoken no, for? I'm not, even, I'm not even watching. This okay. Mind is open, time is open. I said to Marianne, I'm going to talk for 20 ahead. minutes. How long have I been talking for? Nobody's, nobody's coughing, nobody's, okay. nobody's asking. I think you should just carry on. Okay. First Thanks. cough, I cut you off. That's a good deal. That's a deal. Thank you. Mm. That was just because I prompted you psychologically. Someone coughed. It was, it was Benny Rabinovitz. It was Benny Rabinovitz. You coughed, Benny. Overruled. Thank you. Thank you. Marianne, we will keep Benny in check. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Strans Advocate Strancham Ford, Strancham Ford, who knows the name? Yes. He was, yes, 
He was desperately sick, and he was in the final stages of cancer. He wanted to have physician-assisted termination, either euthanasia or suicide. The two are very different, PAE and PAS. And the High Court granted him, appearing through representatives, an order in 2015. Judge Fabricius in the Pretoria High Court granted it to him. The difficulty with Judge Fabricius's order is that two hours before he delivered his judgment in open court, Advocate Strancham Ford had died. And when the state was appalled by the judgment, because it was a, a judgment to which I'll return in a moment, uh, the state appealed against the judgment to the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein. And the state said, we don't want this judgment to stand because it, it okays both physician-assisted suicide and physician-assisted uh, euthanasia. The difference, of course, is that in the one, the physician enables you, gives you the uh, means to terminate your life, but that you take the last active step. Whereas with physician-assisted euthanasia, the physician takes the last uh, active step. And that's what is, is, is licensed in, in both Holland and Belgium and other uh, northern, mo mostly northern European countries, and increasingly in many states of the United States, Oregon, Washington, and a few other states. The Supreme Court of Appeal set aside the judgment of Judge Fabricius. We wait in, in the Constitutional Court. We have to decide what cases we hear, but people have to bring applications before us. The estate of, of Advocate Strange from Ford has not applied. It's been some months since the appeal court judgment, which I think was at the end of last year, maybe it was October, so it's a very long time. You've got to apply within three weeks to our court if you want to overturn a judgment. If there have been very difficult circumstances, you can ask for condemnation for that period, but it would be very difficult to consider what circumstances there might be now if they try to come to us now. So I'm assuming that the family of, of Advocate Strange from Ford is not appealing against the appeal court judgment, which set aside what was undoubtedly the most liberal judgment in South African legal history on this matter. Uh, the, su the Supreme Court of Appeal, Judge Malcolm Wallace, uh, criticized Judge Fabricius quite rigorously because he failed to distinguish between PAE and PAS. And he said physician-assisted suicide has never been illegal depending on the circumstances. That was a very useful thing to salvage from uh, an otherwise quite constricting judgment by, by Judge Wallace and four of his colleagues in Bloemfontein. So Leon can help me, and there's been a, a appellate division authority of many years standing on this, uh, on when it becomes uh, murder to, if you induce someone, if, you, if they no longer have the will to exercise an independent judgment, it could well be murder. But if I retain the exercise of independent judgment to the lost, and Leon gives me the tablets, it is probably not murder. But don't do it too often, Leon, because it's a dicey area. I'm being quite serious, because Leon has got a practice, and I know a lot of doctors, to my mind, uh, quite rightly and very humanely, are, I hope, sympathetically minded to the plight of those uh, in extreme circumstances who are living lives of anguish and pain with no uh, prospect of betterment or, or, or a return of their life faculties and capacities. And that's the real dilemma that the Strancham Ford judgment creates, ladies and gentlemen, that I think the same issue that I mentioned about the, the issue that gives rise to ageism, which is our fear of our own mortality, our fear of our own frailty and our own capacity for debility and sickness and grief, I think that also leads us to fetishize human life and to uh, invest inappropriate doctrinal, ideological, religious. Are there any self-confessed monotheists here? It's a joke, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Leon, you're a self-confessed monotheist, aren't you? But the, 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 worst, the worst attributions of fetishization of human life come from, from monotheists. So those of you who are monotheists, I'm having a go at you. But ladies and gentlemen, the fact is that as we become aged, that 
that debate is intense. It's why Oregon and Washington and other states have changed their laws, because more and more people will face the circumstance where they do not wish to continue living, where to continue living will be only anguishing, only grief-stricken, only painful, with no prospect of improvement, and in those circumstances the law of a few American states and of some of the Northern uh, European countries permits them to, to terminate their lives. Let me finish, Marianne. Last point. Fourteen point and last. I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, that, that we... How do we see each other? We all have the capacity to see each other, and depending on our own self-perception, the more humanely we see each other, ourselves, the more capacity we have for humane viewing of another person, and perhaps even for humane viewing of another sentient creature. I hope that there's some animal rights advocates here. Are there any animal rights advocates here? Any vegetarians? Thank you. No, thank you. you. You're concerned about sentience and about suffering, and that's a larger moral compass than most of us have, and I honor you for that. Do we see aged people as recipients of pity, charity, as claimants of time, of resources, as a source of demands upon us? Or do we see them as bearers of competences beyond our own, of knowledge beyond our own, of power and experience that can enrich our lives? Those are the choices that ageism and age-appropriate differentiation offers us. And the good thing, and this is where I end, is the good thing about bigotry, about people living with AIDS, the good thing about racism, the good thing about homophobia, a natural fear of people like myself, lesbians and gays. You're a self-proclaimed lesbian. Six. Yeah, really. The good thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you have prejudices about us, is that you can start now on dismantling them. And that's the good thing about this evening, that it's an affirmation, it's a breakthrough, it's the first time that I've ever been invited to talk about this topic, and it's a good moment for us to start because those prejudices and fears lie only here. They don't exist in the external world. Let us resolve, each for ourselves and all of us together, to make it better. Thank you. You, you can do it without the microphone. I can do it without the microphone. <laughs> and you can do it too. I, first of all, thank you very much, Leon, for inviting me to moderate. Thank you very much, Judge Cameron, for your... For your uh, Edwin. Judge, okay. Edwin. I want to call you Judge Cameron or your Honourable or your Majesty or whatever we can do. <laughs> it's fun. Um, and, and I'm very delighted when I spoke to Leon on the phone about hosting this particular evening because um, this is something that, that I really feel quite strongly about. And what you said at the end of what you've, your speech now is so important. We live in an age of intersectionality. I'd like to include you in the discussion as well in terms of your research and, and, and where we're going with this. Because we live in a, in, a, in a time when young people are speaking about intersectionality, yet I have never heard any of them speak about age as particularly as one of those prejudices. And I think this also has to do a lot with DSTV uh, more than anything else. Um, and a particular American notion in the world, which is exported, America is very good at exporting culture, where you see people obsessed with uh, Botox, whitening their teeth, mm. coloring our hair, mm. uh, doing all of these things to sort of stop uh, the, the visible displays of, of, um, of what it means to be older. It's time to fight back, people, and us, the gays. We've done enough of that fighting back. And I, I often, you know, every now and again, there was something on television one Sunday evening. It was a, two men and a woman in bed together at a six o'clock primetime show. And if you come from where I come from, I went into the lounge and thought, but my God, this, you know, can't be on television now. But the, then realized immediately the glory of it, that it is on television mm. now. So it is mm. possible, I think. Um, I'd like to try and speak about how do we pull together this, uh, I feel like you've just pierced the scrim of something, and that we're needing to, to find a way of, uh, find concrete ways, first of all through campaigns and other things of making this part of a national conversation. Older people 
uh, are often abused in ways that we don't think. They're seen as a resource, yet not as a resource. So economically, the number of families I know where older people are being abused by their children in terms of you know, thinking that there's some money somewhere. Mm. Um, old age homes, how they are run, pensions, uh, there's, just, it's, 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 there's just so much of it. So, uh, Leon, the, the research that you're conducting, um, I don't think anybody else is, 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 has embarked on this at this particular point. Well, um, thanks, Marianne. Um, on the contrary, there are a number of people and colleagues of ours in the room over here, from people from the Northwest University, Jaku Hoffman, and from UCT, uh, Sebastian Akalula and Mark Combrink. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we are interested in is a lot of focusing on older people focuses on the geriatrics, the, the mets and the health side of it. Very little of it focuses on the social side of it. And um, I think it's really important that we need to start asking these things. You ask about the intersectionality of it. It's about understanding where our prejudice comes from. And um, it's also understanding, and, and, I, and I like your, your comment about the Botox and whatever. I think we should welcome every gray hair we get. Not enough people in this world get gray hair. You know, uh, when you look at South Africa, where we had with the HIV epidemic, the average life expectancy dropping into the early 50s. So we need to welcome gray hair. Um, I think what's interesting as well from a media perspective is to see actually, you know, it was said that a Hollywood actress over the age of 40 was washed up. But now you're seeing all these fabulous movies that are coming out about older actors and actresses who have found a wonderful lease on life. I mean, Judy Dench, I mean, who would not go see a movie today with Judy Dench in it? Meryl, uh, Streep. Meryl Streep, Bill Nighy, all these fabulous actors who are well into their 60s, late 70s, maybe early 80s. Um, so I think we are starting to reframe and see how we see older people. The problem is that within national policy, it's not being spoken about. And okay. And so how do we begin? I mean, if we look at the struggle for lesbian and gay rights, LBGTI, and we keep adding on wonderful extra ones, which some of us who are older don't quite know where to go, which is lovely. Um, uh, how do we begin to then uh, uh, realize the rights that exist, look at the definitions that, that do exist in legislation, and make older people aware of this? Because what we do do, we tend to do, we seem to do in South Africa, is, is push older people into the periphery. We, uh, we put them in homes, and I heard a terrible call on Cape Talk recently of a home in Pinelands where there was no food. Uh, for the for the older people, I mean, and how, uh, there is no ombudsperson. Mm. There seems to be no office or any structure mm. within social services, mm. even apart from giving people their pensions. That's about it. Uh, and also, when my father got really ill at 87, the medical profession, the, all the hospitals started rubbing their hands because they thought he had a medical aid they could probably mm. extract as much as they could. And so there were terrible, huge amounts of interventions that were unnecessary at the time. So we have all of these. Is there provision in the, in the law for an ombudsperson or such? And does that work? Too fast. Oh, so, OK. Into the mic. I was just saying, is, do we have an oversight structure in the legislation, such as an ombudsperson, uh, who could, in a sense, realize the potential rights that exist for older people in the legislation itself um, or within the Department of Social Development or in, in any other laws where we need to begin to actually act out, not talk about, because they, it exists in law. Sorry for not... Uh... Now, Marianne, I think you raise a, a, a very important anterior issue, which is the issue that, that you and Leon touched on a, a moment ago, which is who speaks for older, for, for older people? And there we have n not so much a racial problem, although it is a largely racially localized or defined problem, we have a class problem, which is that we have, if you like me, I was actually in hospital twice last year, the one was for an arthroscopy, one was for a, 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 a liver abscess, and I got as good care as anyone would get in Sydney or New York or London. There's no doubt about it, it was absolutely superb. That's 15% of us, ladies and gentlemen. It used to be 15% white people. It's now about 9 or 10% of those 15% are white, and the other 6 or 7% are black people. Uh, and if you increase, if you, if, you, if, you, if you include all forms of medical insurance, it probably goes up to about a fifth of our country. So those of us who are middle class, and the, and the class striation of it is important, because those of us who came tonight, 
we got onto the My City bus, as my sister did from Sea Point. We got into our cars, as Leon did. Uh, and we are middle-class people who've got those benefits. Not all of us. I'm not in attributing to you a uniform measure of wealth or affluence. But most of us are more affluent than most other people in the country. Is that fair to say? Benny, is that fair to say? Benny agrees. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, the, the question is, how, how do we get the people who don't have the medical aids to complain about pylons? And that's the interesting thing, Marianne, and it's, it is a paradox of activism that most of the LGBTI people in the United States were middle class. Mm -hmm. South Africa was different. Zaki Ahmad came from a working class background. Pumzi Lemutetwa came from, from Kwatema and Springs. But nevertheless, the LGBTI movement has largely been middle class because of resources, because of leisure, because of, 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 of expressive advantages which, which your class status confers on you. And I think that's what's afflicting the, 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 age, the age thing. So I, we do have in, in March, in August 1905, there was founded the South African uh, Older Persons Forum. In June 2016, last year, the South African Human Rights Commission convened a meeting on, on, on older persons. And uh, I don't think the HRC has a specific office or person appointed for older persons. But there we've got an idea that we should ask the, the Human Rights Commission. There's a, 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 there's a new chairperson, a very, very impressive person, ladies and gentlemen, called uh, Bongani. Uh, he was at the Legal Resources Center. And he is now chair of the Human Rights Commission. It's a good time to lobby him. But who's going to do it? Is there anyone here who's going to lobby him to, 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 to appoint a person for that? So, so that, that's the paradox. And it's the paradox of all activism. And I think also we, we, uh, what's quite interesting, if you look at sort of the structure of the newsrooms in the media as well, I think there are lots of younger people uh, in newsrooms. In fact, my 18-year-old my niece asked me this evening if she should come because she's a fan of yours. And I strangely, in my, in, with my own internalized ageism, said, well, maybe in 40 years' time you need to come. In actual fact, she needs to come now. She needs to be here right now. And my children have also sort of mock me when I can't answer my phone quick enough or swipe. So... Um, uh, interestingly enough, also we should, as we've learned as, as lesbian and gay activists, the use of language itself. So we call it the old age pension. I think it's still called that in the Department of Social Development. So those, uh, LAP, so to, to even sort of maybe perhaps lobby for the change of, of, of the language. The language, in, it carries so much significance in it. Um, in my experience in sort of the care centers, middle class care centers, um, I'm, I often wonder what happens to working class pensioners? Where do they end up? Are they care centers? We have no idea. Because even in the middle class care centers, there's a, there's a dire, I mean, a lot of people uh, have no family. Uh, I, my father insisted on going to a space in Somerset West, um, and I, our family saw him a lot, but there were many, many elderly people there with absolutely no uh, connection to family. The staff were badly trained, um, and the co costs were exorbitant, and there didn't seem to be any set standard scale for, uh, for what we had. So, uh, Leon, is, 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 uh, what happens to poor working class people? Uh, and, what, and what kind of, of, of provisions for community care do we have? Well, um, I can answer. There are some people in this audience who are far more expert at it, and maybe um, without wanting to point out some people, but someone like Gavin Weir, who's sitting at the back over there, who heads up the intersectoral task team for older persons in the Western Cape, could, could talk about some of these issues. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone from social development over here, but... It's highly variable. There's, um, one, I think Edwin pointed out that the Older Persons Act of 2006 and the regulations which came out about two or three years later is this fabulous document. Um, it's based around, I think a lot of it came out of what was happening in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And it describes the size of a room that a person, mm -hmm. if you're living in institutional care, the size of the room that you've got to live in, how many lumens of light you've got to have in the, in the, in the, in the corridors, um, how many staff you've got to have per person living in the facility. But there's no talk to who funds these facilities. There's no, all of these facilities are self-funded. And when you're looking at a, an old age pension, as we, or a grant of 1,600 rand a month, 
for an older person. And then there's, if you, live, if you meet the criteria for frail care, there's an added amount of, uh, on a sliding scale of maybe up to about two and a half or 3,000 rand. Uh, who can afford to keep an older person for 4,000 rand when you've got to provide them with incontinence products, food, care, and you want skilled caregivers, but we can't afford to pay skilled caregivers, so then anyone who comes in off the street and says, I'm willing to help lift or turn or do something to someone, Who's going to do that? Can we live, can anyone in this audience live on 4,000 Rand a month? So if the state is not willing to augment that, we are going to have these issues. We're going to have the same issues that arose with the life is in many, uh, maybe mental health got it right because they actually were able to bring it to the fore, but no one's done an investigation into the unnecessary deaths. And we always point fingers at the service providers but the service providers are, are living in an incredibly resource-constrained environment. They can't provide the service that are demanded of them because there's no funds for it. And we're asking poor people to pay for their care and upkeep, mm. and, and they can't. Mm. Mm. On, on many levels, on, on a sort of meta level, for me, it, it, it preys into the commodification of everything, particularly when one is desperate. And I think when we live in a world where um, Everyone seems to increasingly be making, wanting to make a buck. Uh, my father's little room was 15,000 rand a month. His pension was 4,000. Um, so it, the, the, you know, other people had to sort of help out. And he was middle class, worked all his life. Um, is, is, I mean, are there countries in the world where we have a model where there is some sort of cross-subsidization, where if you have a pension but not enough, um, like sort of these academic hospitals that people can go to, but we're very far away from um, even getting there. I know that we've got the Cape Old Age, what's a CPOA, where there are uh, provincial old age homes. Um, Avalon is one of them, and if you, if, you, if you go into them, they're horrendous. They're absolutely horrendous. Um, they, they smell of urine, they leak. Uh, nobody does any oversight visits, and uh, so... Um, Leon, uh, yeah, uh, tell us a bit about the training of carers and whatever else. It seems like I'm hogging the floor and no, maybe no, there. No, um, I, I would hate to, uh, Marianne, for, for the simple reason, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's, I would hate to point fingers at any one facility. I think most of these facilities are running under incredibly constrained conditions. Um, and um, what, what often happens with large organizations that provide services to older people is that they, they take from the rich to pay for the services of the poor. So this cross-subsidization. Um, you ask, interestingly, in South Africa, of all the sub-Saharan African countries, I think we're the only country that's providing, at this point, an, an, old, an, old, an old age pension. Um, I've just been to a meeting in Geneva with the WHO, which I got back from today, speaking to colleagues of ours from India. Um, the, the pension or the social grant of their $6 a month in terms of rupees, I think it's about 200 or 1,200 rupees, something, it's an incredibly small amount, doesn't go to pay for anything. Um, very few other sub-Saharan African countries, if any, I think, have any older person's uh, a grant. So we are doing certain things in this country. Question is, we, we, we have an expectation, and that's why this legislation is possibly needs to be re-looked at, because as you say, it's a wonderful act, and I wonder how it does fit in with what, what when we have such, the, you mentioned the disjunct, between fabulous legislation and service delivery, and who do we hold accountable? Who do we go to with the piece of paper and say, now you've got this legislation, who's going to actually enact it? And That's right. Leon, just, just to make one point, uh, 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 the, the, the Act actually looks at this resources thing. It says regarding implementation of the Act in Section 3.2, recognizing that competing social and economic needs exist, Organs of state must take reasonable measures to the maximum extent of their available resources to achieve the realization of the object of the act. Well, again, it's a goal. There, there, there's, the, the regulations don't actually, as you say, specify where are the resources going to come. This proportion of a provincial budget, this proportion of a local authority's budget, this proportion of the national budget must go there. I'm glad that you make the point, Leon, that the old age pension, the OAP, uh, we, we had this grants case in front of us, it was the, one of the most disturbing and distressing cases I've had, I've been on the bench for 23 years now, I found 
uh, what, what happened in, in that case to be profoundly disturbing to my conceptions of, of law and propriety. And of course, why that was so was that the, the, the livelihood of 17 million people, the most vulnerable people, and a large contingent of them being uh, older persons, old aged persons in, 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 in the terms of the Social Security Act, were at risk. And, and b because of, of what we describe in our judgment, and I think justly so, reckless conduct and heedless conduct on the part of the executive, they, it was put at risk. Uh, so we've done that, but it's precarious. We've done that, and of course it, it's, 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 it's an achievement. The whole social grant system is one of the great achievements of our country. Uh, and and it, it goes against the, the middle class mythology that poor people should get up, get up off their, their chairs, their armchairs, presumably, and go and find work. It, it, it's, an, it's an iniquitous misconception about the way structural inequality and structural dispossession works. So the grant system is prized, but Leon, the, the, the question, Marianne, to get back to the precise question Marianne's asked, it's, it's, a, it's a question of resources, and resources are allocated in response to pressures. That's what politics is about. And we don't have a lobby for older persons. That's where we are. Okay, I'm going to um, open uh, uh, the floor to some questions. And I think a very important point that was raised here this evening, if any of you are in contact with politicians, and often one has to take a shower afterwards, um, uh, I think we should begin to lobby where we can. Um, uh, as at the Daily Maverick, I've just uh, we will undertake to highlight this. I think you, you, you're doing an exhibition as well. You're taking photographs. There was a wonderful book that was published recently, I think in the States, of older, older people. And if, if we had to apply current attitudes, Nelson Mandela would never have been our, our president. Um, so while one understands the, old, old, the older pe persons, we must move on. Uh, we don't have to be moved right out onto the periphery. Um, Marianne, just as an antidote, and before you throw it over to the floor, may I point out that the oldest person ever selected for a first term of presidency in the United States is the current incumbent. <laughs> well, in that case, we should apply very strict retirement rules, perhaps. Make an exception. Um, Maybe he can join the president just north of our borders. They can check in at Nkandla. They can... Uh, all right. Um, just raise your hand if you if you if you have. Uh, we Thank would you. like some expert uh, opinions if there are any. There's a. Thank you, uh, Chair. Over here. Oh, oh, you got. Okay. I think I have the mic. Oh, you do have the mic. It's. Um, it gives me quite an advantage. Pete, um, Peter Story, would you ask us speakers to identify themselves? But, yeah, my name yes. is uh, Peter Story. Um, as I've listened, it's crossed my mind that we we have had a lot of talk about. Uh, what is essentially a Western model of uh, caring for a people. We talked about size of rooms and luminosity of corridors and things like this. Um, and then we've admitted that we just don't have the resources to ensure that the elderly of our country are going to be catered for in that way. It's going to be a small minority. And I just wondered if we shouldn't also, in the midst of all this bemoaning, we might celebrate that we have amongst the very most vulnerable people in our country, the people least regarded, um, the people who queue up for those social grants uh, patiently, month by month, we have a wisdom about age which comes from the African culture, which is not Western, where we tend to want to push elderly people out of sight because they embarrass us. But instead, we have a, a fantastically wise culture about age in African culture. And we can learn from the very people who perhaps are most voiceless, but yet have the greatest wisdom about that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. If, if I can just comment on that, I think one of the, uh, the issues comes down to language and how we use language. What we also, so we, we hear all these terms, talk about the aging tsunami. It's not a tsunami, it's a right to get old. Mm. A tsunami brings devastation with it. Growing old is a right. 
It's not a disease. And, and what we need to also realize is that older people become an incredibly important resource within a community. There are older people in this country who are looking after their grandchildren because the parents have died. Uh, there are older persons who are looking after their grandchildren because the only income that's being brought into the household is that 1,500 or 1,600 rands worth of pension. Um, this audience, by and large, I would imagine the mean age of the audience is probably well into the 60s over here. Uh, and, you know, we are an incredibly resourceful group of, well, I'm not there yet, um, I certainly hope to get there, but we're an incredibly resourceful group of people and we need to become activists for the change that we wish to see in this country. And if we don't do it, it's never going to happen. Uh, you might not be aware of University of the Third Age. Um, it's a university that is actually quite unique. It's happened in other parts of the world. But the person who founded it in South Africa about 10 years ago, Sylvia Shearer, and it's very, the people who have, ex, who have retired and who have expertise offer courses. And it's not just for white middle class people because she's taken it to Guguletu. The same concept is in Guguletu if the community decides what's relevant to them and what is on offer by the experts who have retired. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any Thank other you. questions? Yeah. Oh. Hello. I don't know if this is uh, more academic or just out of interest. You lauded the Brits for having a, a, a definitive view on what geriatric age is. But can we look at, at society? Can we look at things like statutory rape? Can we look at paedophilia? Can we look at the right to drive? Can we look at the right to hang a few years ago in this country? Um, the, the whole of society seems to be demarcated by convenient numbers. And is it not an idea to have a means test for age? Because unfortunately I happen to have friends who have Alzheimer's at 48. And surely they're entitled to the, they shouldn't have to wait till they're 65, even for the 1164 rand that the government grants. It might be an academic question. The other thing is a little bit of research. Um, there is one other country in Africa that has an OAP. It's Eritrea. Uh, but you pre-qualify by having had military service. And of course, they have no gender distinction. So we men and women have fought in <clears throat> all of their atrocious wars. The last thing is uh, you mentioned the United Nations. The United Nations are currently writing a white paper on age. <clears throat> I spoke to the lady today. She's got a very long German name, and if it's of any interest to anybody, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question in front. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe just a comment. I think, like, being a mother, you can't rehearse for it, and so you can't rehearse for being a, a, a child of an elderly parent. I've just returned from Pretoria, where I visited my parents who are 90. And I found there's no manual written, there's no advice. One has to learn by trial and error. And we live in a global village where we're far from our parents. And we're out of the day-to-day -day contact with their needs. And my father retired from working in the small surgery department at university dentistry at 78. And he still boasts about his steady hand. So he's a very proud person and it's difficult the communication and for them because they're proud to say what they need. So how do we as children learn what the needs are and how do we bridge that gap? You know, it's just the dilemma I sit with. I don't know if it's relevant here. I think Edwin raised the issue of fear and we all are incredibly fearful of what we don't know. So we're fearful of talking about getting older. We're fearful of talking about death. We're talking about, fearful about the process between those, those years where we may become frail. We become fearful of, well, we can't talk about issues that um, what's going to happen when I can't make a decision for myself. And unless we actually start having these discussions as children with parents or parents or spouses with one another, 
I think it's really, really important. We all have a will which states what we want when we're dead. Who has a will that states when we don't have the capacity or potentially maybe losing that capacity to state what we want when we're alive? And Edwin, that's one of the things maybe I could address to you from, 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 from the state's perspective. How does this, when will the state start looking at enduring powers of attorney, um, proxy decision making? There's very little in the legislation around it. Leon, I'm very glad you raised it because that was one of the things I didn't include on, in the 14 points I wanted to make. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you have got a living will? Pretty good, but it's less than a fifth, maybe 10, 15 percent. You can just go to, if you Google living will, there's, there's, there's a very good living will to download from the internet. Uh, but Leon is right. Uh, what, what, what you're entitled to do as a legal subject in South Africa is to indicate to those who are able to make decisions when you no longer can what your preferences are. So it's very limited. You, I can say when I'm no longer able to determine my own health choices, I want you, my loved ones, or my power of attorney holder, whoever it is, not to switch on the life support machine, not to uh, go for, like your father, not, not to use life, uh, to, to in, uh, life pr prolonging interventions, which are simply going to protract my life without any quality and without any dignity. So the living will is important, Leon, and it, it has an impact. I, I um, Jeannie's daughter, Molly, is my niece, really cudgeled us all just very recently, uh, I think I turned 60 already, in, into signing it for the first time. Because of that same fear, we postpone making our wills, we postpone a living will, because we don't want to anticipate the time when we're going to be there, and we are going to be there, all of us. It's the one certain thing about life. So, Leon, the point you're making is an important one, because it's very limited. And without statutory intervention, or as Judge Fabricius tried in the, Stran in the Stransom, Stransom Ford case, um, without development of the common law under the Constitution, you're not going to get greater. He got slapped down by, by, the, by the Supreme Court of Appeal. But we need legal development, and we, it's got to come from a lobby. It's got to come from somewhere, from leaders in, 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 in the area, advocates in the area, it's going to take strategizing. You don't want this to be segmented into white middle class affluent people. You want cross, uh, like the lady was speaking about, U3A, you want cross regional, cross border, cross sectoral, cross, cross class, cross, ra cross race uh, alliances to make that happen. Uh, we've got about three, three minutes left. I think that it goes beyond just a living will, and in order to help families, like we heard earlier, um, I think families need to be encouraged to discuss with their older people uh, how do they wish to be, and to write down those wishes in an advance directive. Uh, if you go onto the Dignity South Africa website, you can get a copy of an advance directive, which has far more detail and goes into far greater depth about how I wish to be, should I be in that situation where I'm unable to express myself, unable to tell you who care for me uh, what my greatest needs and wants are. And I think that is very helpful for families, that if there's an advanced directive in place, if your mother or father loses their capability of actually expressing themselves, you have their wishes there in writing and can fulfill them. Thank you very much. It's almost seven o'clock. Um, so, excuse me, I meant to criticize not the, the, the Dignity SA uh, advanced directives. I think they're terrific. I'm, I'm criticizing the legal constrictions that they can't even go further. But you're absolutely right, and, and we should all we should go and look. And you can, they've actually got a, a list of checkable block boxes that you can check or uncheck. It, it, it's a wonderful thing they've done. But Leon's making the point that it should go even further. Hi, just a quick comment. We're talking about when our older people are getting to a point where they are, are leaving us. I think we need to look at how to deal and how to talk and how to be with people that are living still. 
and how to how to communicate with them i think that's also a problem and be be there for them while they are still there i think that's very much a a situation that we need to look at and be trained in i think there's a gap there any more questions What's very important about this evening is what, has, uh, what, what I feel here is that there's an enormous amount of, there are resources and people willing to take this further. We will at the Daily Maverick. They are, you know, if we, in, with regard to you looking after your older parents, uh, I learned a lot uh, from the staff in the home who would say, give your dad Maggie mix because he's, you know, he loses, he needs electrolytes. Uh, and he was falling all the time. And I, there was no one else I could speak to. So perhaps we could connect. Uh, set something up on Facebook where we can ask each other questions because I often thought my father was dying and it's tonight and then tomorrow morning I find him walking around feeding the squirrels and I've had a night of horror uh, and you want to share that and you also want to be able to churches and I think religious institutions should get involved I'm, I'm an atheist and needed to speak to my father alone about his dying and found that very difficult mm -hmm. Uh, but in the end managed by getting through it by saying wherever you're going dad you were there before you were here that was like the atheist's way around it um, <laughs> That's really nice. wasn't it good and then he left he said oh sure and i got him morphine i got him morphine at 11 o'clock at night but that was purely because of my constant involvement and i found a physician who was willing to help who's who was able to say to me you, your father's dying we've got to talk to him now but that was no one else in, at, at uh, the home had that. Uh, and there was a gentleman next to my father who was just moving around in circles the whole time. And I wish I could be there all the time. So ombudsman, I think, very important one. To, or even just a civilian oversight group. Um, so we'll just get rid of Jacob Zuma and then we'll have much more time to lobby for so many things that so many of us want. And just to be careful about the whole thing around culture, I do think what's important, I know I'm the chair, I'm supposed to stop, stop talking, that the, the, the African notion of respecting elders is a very important one and I do think it's something we need to look back towards and reclaim, but at the same time also not romanticize it because I think it's that societies have been deeply scarred and rent apart and I think uh, that perhaps will take our eye off the fact that elderly people are severely abused as well in competition for such few resources so rather we, we've got to find a balance between all of that and I do agree we need to have older people living with us among us well we are old we are living amongst each other now aren't we <laughs> <laughs> there ain't any young people here so here we are thank you very much to all of you for coming can we please stay in touch um, through, through Leon and through this organization. And if you have anything you can offer or anything you can do, I think we should do a nude calendar of old people. <laughs> of us. <laughs> Norbert, you're on the cover. But certainly, um, please make contact with me at the Daily Maverick if we have any ideas. It's going to be a long, I think it's going to take time. But I do feel, thank you very much, Leon, for this. This is, a, as I said, the piercing of the scrum, and we'll take it forward from there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.